resources that are so valuable to our communities. The slides are being recorded and will be released on to you on August 21st, so don't worry. And don't forget to complete the evaluation. Your evaluations are super important to this process, and without the, that information, we can't continue to do this work. Thank you. The agenda goes as follows. Oh, first off, I'm sorry. I'm Larry Scott Walker. <laughs> I'm going to be your facilitator today. I'm sorry. I just jumped right on into everything today. Uh, we'll do a brief overview of V equals V. We'll uh, have Dr. Felsing come with the uh, 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 teaching of the natural progression of HIV in the body. Then I'll be back with my colleague talking about trauma informed support. We'll cover the R3, the re-engage, retain, and reduce program. And then we'll have uh, another beautiful colleague, Damon Johnson, come and present about stigma and trauma. And then I'll come back with some practical advice for people living with HIV, and then we'll open it up to hear from you. That's the, my favorite part of the whole event. Here are the learning objectives. Upon the conclusion of this presentation, participants should be able to, or will be able to, describe V equals V and how it's operationalized. Articulate the role of healthcare providers yourselves in improving health outcomes along the care continuum for people living with HIV. Articulate the role of syndemics in the lives of people living with HIV, especially those with uncontrolled viral loads. List the vulnerabilities that present uh, as a result of viremia, medical, social, and emotional. Apply strategies to successfully empower and engage individuals who fall into the category uh, to live and lead healthier lives. And also to articulate how addressing V equals V can lead to a, a larger population of people living with HIV who are undetectable. Before we begin this space, I would just like to invite you all to center yourselves, however you might, uh, to be present in this moment, uh, feel yourself in your seat, feel your heart beating in your chest, notice your breaths going in and out. And as you are providers, healthcare providers, people who work in healthcare settings, I'm gonna say something that I don't think you hear enough. Thank you. Thank you for your commitment to the lives of people living with HIV, thank you for studying so diligently to bring about medical innovations. Thank you for embodying the culture humility needed to get us all to thriving with HIV, regardless of what our viral loads are. Thank you. Before we start this conversation, it is vitally important to hold up that we are proponents of you equals you. I am a leader of a nonprofit that has the largest network of black gay men living with HIV in the country. And you equals you is our main galvanizer. Letting people, I can, I see the light that shines in a, a person living with HIV's eyes once I tell them that once you become undetectable, you can live a long, healthy life, a normal life. V equals V is not the antithesis to you equals you. It's actually a proponent of it. It's, a, it's the, the, the other side of you equals you. Understanding that people living with HIV with unchecked HIV, not in medical care, not on any type of ARVs, are vulnerable for a host of, of, of intersecting stigmas and conditions. And we'll go deeper into that throughout this conversation. Viremia equals vulnerability. Uncontrolled viral load, as I just said, and people living with HIV can lead to physical, social, and emotional vulnerabilities. First, we'll hear from Dr. Gregory Felsen. Dr. Felsen is currently the medical advisor with the Georgia's Department of Public Health Division of HIV Protection. He works with legislators, community partners across the state um, regarding HIV policy and speaks at the local and state level. Dr. Felsen is a wealth of information and it's my honor to introduce him. See you soon, Dr. Felsen. Good morning, and uh, possibly good afternoon, and uh, welcome. I appreciate you taking the time uh, to have this discussion on V equals V. And today we're going to really talk about kind of the medical aspect of um, viremia. So, uh, next slide. 
We're going to kind of bypass the learning objectives. You will have those uh, in the slide deck uh, when those are released August 21st. So first, we'll kind of think about any type of uh, disease process. We really want to kind of think about the progression. And this was put out in 1992 by the CDC, and it still holds true today when we really think about disease processes. For example, we could uh, put any type of disease process into this uh, uh, algorithm and it's kind of a life algorithm. So for example, diabetes, we all know folks with diabetes, we kind of can think of the stage of susceptibility. Is it genetic? Is it, uh, is it uh, behavioral? Is it uh, eating? Is it having a high BMI? What does that look like? Um, that could be the, the uh, stereotypical exposures when we're thinking about diabetes. Then really kind of think about the stage of subclinical disease. There starts to um, organ damage, there starts to be breakdown of the system where our sugars begin to rise, and then the onset of symptoms, which typically there could be a delay between the onset of symptoms and then the usual diagnosis. And then we start to look at the stage of clinical disease where we might, might start seeing um, uh, renal dysfunction, neurological dysfunctions with neuropathies, and then hopefully individuals were caught early enough in the process, placed on therapy, so there's either recovery, there could be disability in, in, the, in the world of diabetes. When I worked for um, the Cherokee Nation, we unfortunately saw a lot of amputations, so that, that did lead to disability, or we saw death due to cardiovascular disease associated with it. Next slide. So if we kind of have this in, as a mindset and we kind of think about the natural progression of HIV and, and, I, and I quickly looked at some of the attendees and I've been caring for individuals living with and affected uh, with HIV since 1992 and there are a few folks on this call that have been caring for folks for longer than I have and there are some newer folks to, to HIV care. And I have to remind myself and others that we have somebody sitting in front of us who was just diagnosed with HIV. They've never seen this. And I take care of some folks who have been, were diagnosed with HIV 10, 15 years ago. And I still bring this up and some of them will say, oh, I'm very familiar with that or I've never seen this. And when you kind of look through this and guide them through this, I've had individuals who do not want to go on therapy for various reasons or they're really not adherent with their therapy. And we can kind of talk through this process that if you look to the left of this and we look at primary infection, we suddenly have this very high HIV viral load. And this is a time when individuals are highly uh, infectious and can transmit HIV. So we're not talking U equals U here. This individual is not on treatment. This is just the natural progression of HIV. Um, now, if we catch individuals early enough, and we've had a lot of folks really um, start rapid start, rapid entry, whichever term you're using, and getting individuals, especially with acute HIV on therapy, it really drops that viral set point. Is that going to change long-term morbidity mortality? Well, time will tell us that. But if we do nothing, and I do have some clients that say, I don't want to go on treatment. I knew somebody on treatment and they died on treatment or they had a lot of side effects. And that might have been at a time when um, there was a high pill burden. There were a lot of uh, adverse uh, events associated with those therapies. And we see, we're seeing less and less of that. But typically what will happen is, is that viral load will have a set point. It'll kind of level off as you see the red line the immune system will eventually collapse. Um, without therapy, the average individual is making 10 billion new virons per day, and that uh, uses up the uh, resources that we have. Eventually, the immune system collapses. Individuals start to see symptoms opportunistic diseases, and then ultimately death. And on average, that's eight to 10 years. And of course, life is a bell curve. And I've seen, I took care of a gentleman with a CD4 count of 10, did not want to go on therapy, who was able to survive another three years with surprisingly good quality of life. And we've seen rapid progressors where individuals were diagnosed with HIV. Within three years, they had the diagnosis of AIDS. It all depends on multiple factors, which we will, which we will discuss. But I think it's at least important to show folks newly diagnosed this chart and say, we can change this outcome. This is not a death sentence because I still have folks come in and their number one question is, when am I going to die of this? Well, if we do nothing, here's what the, this is what the average individual will experience. Next slide. The other aspect that we really think about is, is a lot of the staging that the CDC puts out is for research purposes and really uh, surveillance purposes. So I'll still have individuals that will come in. Uh, they're frantic. Again, their number one question is, when am I going to die of this? I was told I have AIDS. 
here I am, what do I need to do? And they're completely asymptomatic. They do not have an AIDS defining condition, which we'll see here in a moment. And their CD4 count was 199. So yes, technically you have stage three disease and yes, technically you have AIDS, but um, this is not a death sentence at this, at this juncture. We still have therapies that um, we can get you really virally suppressed and rapidly have immune recovery. Next slide. So there's a laundry list that the CDC has provided are uh, stage three or AIDS defining opportunistic illnesses. These could be cancers, these could be a, vi a variety of bacterial, fungal, yeast infections, um, but there are some criteria associated with this. So we need to look at this and really say, mm, okay, I've had individuals come in and said, oh, I, I was told I have AIDS because I have oral thrush. Oral thrush is not an AIDS defining illness. Now, if you have candidiasis of the esophagus, that's different. So we need to re rethink that. So really need to think about this process, take the history, and I try my best to alleviate any anxiety individuals may have, especially when they're newly diagnosed or they're not missing a lot of doses. So there are a lot of reasons why that happens. So we need to have those discussions and sometimes we need to go back to square one. Next slide. So when we really think about treatments, uh, and this is the most up-to-date uh, DHHS guidelines, and of course, usually between September and December, we have updates. But what you can see what's recommended is uh, integrase-based um, with a TAF FTC or TDF FTC. You can see some of your 3TC. But the bottom line is, is the um, boosters, ritonavir and cobisostat, have been moved down to recommended under certain clinical situations. So a couple of things as we move forward. You know, I remember back in the 90s where people were walking in with no medications and walking out with several bottles and maybe taking 18, 20 or more pills per day. Um, and we were doing a lot of hospice care. And now you can see here we have several single tablet regimens and all of these other than uh, if you're going to give raltegravir twice a day, there is a, a raltegravir HD you can give once a day, two pills once a day, that we have um, either single tablet regimens, once a day regimens. So that really improves adherence. And then also as we have an aging population, we have a lot of comorbidities by removing those um, boosters, the ritonavir cobisostat, we're removing some of the drug-drug interactions and some of the issues that we've, we've had. That's not to say there's still some adverse events with these medications that we have to consider and we don't have time today to discuss those. Next slide. The other thing that we have to have to consider, there's a lot of data that's coming out and it's just truly a fire hydrant. And if you look at the current DHHS guidelines, it talks about individuals that have a viral load between 50 and 200. Um, so they're not going to progress to uh, an, AIDS, an AIDS condition. Um, but this was an interesting uh, a paper that came out in Croy, and I thank Dr. Cash for putting this slide together, that really talks about if those individuals are between 50 and 1,000, there can still be some non-AIDS cancers, <clears throat> thromboembolism, pulmonary hypertension, renal and liver disease. There's still some inflammation going on because there's, vir there's a higher level of viral replication. So this is kind of a good study to kind of let us think about that. So we have those individuals between 50 and 200. What, what do we need to do with them? Now, and I have some cases, there is nothing out. They're on their last regimen. Now there are some newer agents that hopefully are gonna be FDA approved. We're going through compassionate use. Hopefully we can get them less than 50, but we're observing them and doing evaluations, doing that kind of that primary care and making sure that they're not developing any of these, uh, these uh, end organ damage issues that we can see with individuals living with a, with a virus that's pro-inflammatory. Next slide. So on the flip side of that, we have individuals who are elite controllers. And really, if we go to the guidelines, there's limited data on the benefits of initiating ART. But yet, when we look further into the, to the literature, the START and Temprano trials really showed that ART antiretroviral therapy is beneficial at all CD4 counts. There's ongoing HIV replication. ART is recommended. Um, declining CD4 counts, development of HIV-related complications. So we really want individuals to be virally suppressed. Individuals who have a normal CD4 count, I will have that. I'll say, well, my CD4 count's normal. It's 800. Why do I need to go on therapy? Well, there's still immune activation going on. 
even individuals who are elite controllers, and this declines with antiretroviral therapies. And, and there was a study, that, one of those studies that they mentioned, which I find interesting, even with elite controllers, without being on ARVs, they're hospitalized more often for cardiovascular disease and respiratory disease. So another reason to say, hey, we need to really start this therapy. So there is some rationale for prescribing ART in elite controllers, but if, I, but if you have that client that's just adamant, I do not want to take a pill every day, I'm not going to do this, well, we need to make sure we follow CD4 decline. Is there a loss of viral control? Are there other complications related to HIV that we need to consider? Next slide. So what I'd really ask folks to do, and, and there's a paper that came out earlier in 2020, so this year, it's the second uh, reference that I have here. It's a, so it's the www.nature.com uh, reference. Really goes into the details of looking at this Venn diagram. So I've really simplified this. So the, the paper is wonderfully written. It talks about you know, what's going on from the virus side, what's going on from the cellular immunity side, what's going on from the genetic side, and can there be an intersection where there can be a functional cure. And it really talks about up-to-date uh, data that really talks about elite controllers and really does support that individuals uh, do take antiretroviral therapies. Next slide. So I just mentioned this not to go into the details of follow-up, but just to kind of remind folks uh, where they're at, because we have individuals, when I say going in and out of care, that doesn't mean they're going off ARVs and they're back on AR ARVs. We have that population. But what I mean is we have individuals that have insurance and they're seeing a provider and they may change jobs and their insurance changes. Maybe they have what's called a lot of folks call partial insurance, so not full insurance, or they lose their insurance altogether. In, in this age of COVID, we have some businesses not doing well, so let several businesses have closed their doors. Folks are trying to find jobs, they're unemployed. Um, so all of a sudden they're required to kind of move their health care and sometimes there's a gap or a delay into uh, Ryan White where I practice, Ryan White Part B. So they might be following guidelines from the primary care provider. And if you look at this top part where, you know, my, my provider never gets my CD4 count because the guidelines say I've been virally suppressed for more than two years. My CD4 counts over 500. CD4 monitoring is optional. Or they'll say um, I've been virally suppressed for the last five years. So once a year, I, I go to the local lab that's near me and in some rural areas, they might go to LabCorp, get their blood drawn, but then the next six months, they see the provider and get labs. And then the next six months, they just go to the lab. Why am I required to be seen every six months? You know, what's different? Well, there's HRSA guidelines, there's funding guidelines that have to be followed through ADAP where individuals need to be seen every six months. So educating folks about a new system. So they may have been in the medical system for years, but now they're coming into a new system and they need some education and some navigation to get through that system. Next slide. So when we think about this and when that individual that comes in, maybe they don't want to take medications, maybe they're, they're on again, off again, or they're stretching their medications. They take them every other day, every third day. It's really to sit down and take an opportunity to have discussions with, with folks, whether they're completely adherent and they've been stable and undetectable for years, or they're not adherent or they're not ready for meds to think about this. And I have a lot of folks that come in and said, oh, transportation's the issue. Well, it's not as simple as that. I might send even in small towns before COVID, we, we were seeing more Lyft and Uber drivers. Well, the Lyft driver shows up, the, the client uh, doesn't get in the car, they recognize the car, they recognize the driver, they don't want that individual to uh, drop them off at the clinic that might disclose something about them. There might be abuse going on at home. Um, so whether that's emotional, whether that's physical, um, there might be unstable housing. That individual might be couch hopping. Um, just because they have no place to stay. So five days here, six days there, one day here. So it makes it very challenging. And also when I talk about um, workforce capacity, providers are coming and going in some clinics. So they get comfortable with a provider and six months later, they're gone. Levels of knowledge, people are coming into HIV care that need a lot more support because they're new to this. We were all there at one time. Um, so there are programs and state programs available to kind of help with that so people don't feel isolated. Next slide. And you're going to hear more about this and also hear more about inter intersectionality through today. So I just talked about this. It's to me, it's it's rarely one issue. Um, the pharmacy is not getting my medications on time, but yet I don't have transportation yet. I don't have access to a vehicle um, whenever I need that. My phone number changes every month. So there's so many factors that we have to keep it that we have to consider. Next slide. 
So let's look on the other side of this. Um, so the other side is I'll have clients say, well, what, what, what's going to benefit me from taking these medications? Well, it's going to benefit the person because it's, it's going to decrease that inflammatory process and it's going to extend their uh, life and not just extend their life, but quality of life. And we've already talked about initially, uh, Larry talked about U equals U. You are going to decrease transmissions. So you're not transmitting this to your partner. So if you look at overall uh, uh, life expectancy and comorbidity free life expectancy, um, it's nine years. So if someone who's diagnosed at uh, age 21, there's a nine year gap and that's overall. I'm going to show you some other data and 16 year gap as far as comorbidity. So if somebody goes on therapy, next slide, how does this change and where does that change? So over time with better treatments, with more rapid entry, greater screening, linking individuals to care, we can really see these gaps are decreasing across the board, some faster than others, as you can see on the slide. And again, you will have access to this. And this was a abstract 151 from Croy this year. It's really exciting data. Uh, next slide. And, and part of this that was really exciting was, again, you were looking at overall data. So if you look at this and you look on the left, if somebody is diagnosed at the age of 21, let's say, and, and let's say that's their acute infection, their CD4 counts over 500 and they initiate antiretroviral therapy, you can see that the overall life expectancy, there's no gap, it's gone. So we can truly tell folks, you're going to live, just like Larry mentioned, you're going to live a normal life. Now, again, we're not God. We can't predict when, when it's your time. But from your HIV standpoint, as long as you stay in care, you're taking your antiretroviral therapies, you are expected to have no gap in your overall, overall life expectancy. So that's extremely exciting. But on the other side, if you look on the right side of this, that there's still that 16-year gap, meaning that... Um, an individual who uh, is diagnosed with HIV at age 21, um, they're going to start to see these comorbidities at age 34, 35, 36 versus their HIV negative counterpart will start to see comorbidities normally at age 50, 51, 52. So we have to keep that in mind and really somebody who is, quote, stable and doing well there is still some inflammation going on. We still have to have these conversations. We still have to look and make, follow liver disease, kidney disease, et cetera, and making sure that um, they haven't developed any of these processes. Next slide. So I think those are some really exciting things. And of course, uh, we've all seen the EHE um, information, but again, our new clients haven't. People who are new to HIV and, and new providers, you know, they're, they're getting their feet wet. So really think about, we want to make sure that we diagnose all individuals with HIV as early as possible. Get individuals on treatment. Um, those individuals that uh, could potentially are HIV negative and do their lifestyle, what can we do to prevent them from getting HIV? If they're substance use disorder and they're injecting, they're not going to stop tomorrow. Can we have drug, ex I mean, needle exchange, uh, making sure they're cleaning their paraphernalia uh, correctly, doing those type of things for prevention and then having open non-judgmental discussions throughout this, throughout this process. Um, response rapidly to detection if there is a, a cluster of HIV like they saw in Indiana. How does that look? So we want to make sure that we can de really decrease and make HIV a rare, uh, a rare diagnosis uh, in the next 10 years. Next slide. But we can't do that without uh, rem remembering our um, rural counterparts. And the CDC at the end of 2017 reported that 23% of new diagnoses in the Southeast were occurring outside of urban centers. So yet the most impacted area in Georgia are the four big counties, um, Fulton, DeKalb, Cobb, uh, Gwinnett. But if I don't have time to talk about this, we have 159 counties in the state and there are individuals living with and affected by HIV in all 159 counties. So we really need to have um, equity, access, and, you know, individuals being able to uh, receive the care that they need. Next slide. And then, of course, we always have to think on the horizon. Um, there have been three documented cures of HIV, the Berlin patient, London patient, and more uh, recently the Dusseldorf patients. They've tried to uh, mirror these in studies. There's high morbidity and mortality um, with what these individuals had gone through with bone marrow transplantation. Could there be an HIV vaccine in the future? Um, there's always HIV breakthroughs. We're having new classes of medications uh, that have been approved um, just this year, and we expect that um, in the near future. And of course, we would all like to see a cure for HIV. 
Next slide. So thank you so much and look forward to the questions and the rest of the discussion uh, this morning. Again, going into this, this brief break, the slides and the are being recorded and will be available on August 21st. Please leave your comments and any questions that you may have in the question and answer and any comments that you may have in, a, in the chat box. Greetings, everyone. It's Evan, the members from the ATC team. I'd like to share a few announcements with you, so tune in. Like Thrive SS for our agency spotlight. Thrive SS has the largest network for black gay men living with HIV in the country. Uh, established on May 4th, 2015, Thrive SS uh, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded by three black gay men living with HIV to create a safe space and sense of belonging for other positive black gay men living with HIV in the Southern United States. The founders of this agency, Larry Scott Walker, Dwayne Bridges, and Daniel Driffin, developed the Undetectables model, a tiered peer support model that combines online support, in-person support, and friends, social, and Judy support to address issues that Black people who are living with HIV face. Uh, their mission is to help equity Black gay men living with HIV through direct service, through direct support, excuse me, advocacy, and building collective community power. Their vision, death, stigma, and shame for Black gay men living with HIV. Their that it's a we, not an I movement. They then growth, unity, compassionate care, integrity, transparency, and trust, and truth seeking as a process of learning and conveying the lessons and learnings. And they believe that innovation is to do what is not being done on behalf of their constituents. The Thrive SS mantra, you plus social media equals social support, is one that they live by. Information for Thrive SS in the chat box. The best way to engage is via Facebook, Twitter, their email, or by phone. Thank you. Welcome back from the break, everyone. Thank you for that spotlight. That warmed my heart. I'm Larry Scott Walker, the executive director and co-founder of Thrive Support Services, and I'm joined with one of my colleagues, and we're going to talk about trauma-informed support, understanding that all people living with HIV, just all people in general, deserve adequate support, and especially those most vulnerable amongst us, especially those living with unchecked uh, HIV. So here uh, we have some uh, tenets of trauma-informed support as it relates to people living with detectable viral loads, especially for those who may not be in care or uh, may not be adherent to their medications. First, we realize we realize that that every person living with HIV as has been represented on this call and will be represented on this call even further, that not, not every person living with HIV will attain a viral viral suppression, and that's okay. Um, also understanding that the reasons why this exists, some of those reasons being a lack of, of access to adequate uh, access to like, adequate health care, you know, feelings of stigma and shame, uh, provider bias, which we'll dig deeper into in a second. Um, some long-term survivors who have been on multiple regimens uh, living with HIV over 30 plus years may not be able to attain viral suppression, as well as people who use drugs. And then work, do everything at our power as pr practitioners, as providers to eradicate viral load stigma, uh, checking in with your patients and making sure that they're not like, you know, bashing themselves because they have a detectable viral load, understanding, making sure that we check viral load stigma in our professional spaces as well. On this side, we talk about how to foster self-love and HIV acceptance for our members and clients. Understanding that the opposite of, or the answer to stigma isn't anti-stigma. It's not centering stigma. It's centering the person living with HIV, their self-love, making sure that they're reminded of their resiliency, their power. And HIV acceptance, understanding that HIV is just a thing of, uh, and a sea full of things that happen to us throughout our life. And there is no reason to feel any type of way about being a person living with HIV. Again, we're taking a, a trauma-informed approach. So understanding the role that stigma and judgment plays in the lives of people living with HIV and how it impacts out the way that we see ourselves and our ability to, 
our abilities to adequately take care of ourselves. It's responding in ways that are compassionate, useful, centering things that are useful to the person living with HIV, not anecdotes, not one size fits all answers. And then seeking to restore those parts of the person living with HIV that are bruised or damaged throughout the trajectory of being a person living with HIV with like Dr. Fezzen talks about, spoke to earlier, multiple intersecting oppressions and uh, barriers that uh, supersede and transcend HIV. Recommendations on how to be a trauma-informed supporter. The expectation, our expectation of you is that by the end of this conversation that you are able as a pro provider to be a trauma-informed supporter. So how, does, how do we do that? This, these are groundbreaking, by the way, so like hold on to your seat. First, don't judge. Don't judge your clients, your members, your patients because they have a detectable viral load, because they don't take their meds, because they may be struggling with some feelings of self-acceptance. And also don't judge yourself for the feelings that may come up for you, especially if you're a person living with HIV as well. And try to just work through the process without judging on either side. Listen, I told you this is groundbreaking. Listen and ask questions. Of, of how your the people in your life, your members, your patients would like for you to support them. What's best, again, going back to giving people things that are useful. Push back on self-stigmatizing statements. Remind your patients and your members and your staff even of their resiliency, their power, you know, that, you know, you know just because the client isn't doing well or just because the, the, the patient isn't doing well, that there's so much other things about them that are, you know, that build their resiliency, understanding that when we're the most empowered, we make the best decisions for ourselves. And reminding your friend or your patient or members that they're not alone, connecting them to some type of support like we have at Thrive SS uh, or support just in general, we can link it to any types of support, understanding that support is one of the best and most effective ways to, you know, uh, embolden and empower people living with HIV. So I would like to bring up one of my colleagues as well as uh, one, a dear friend, Michael Morris, and he's going to talk about some of our drivers and their success stories. Thank you Michael. so much. Thank you so much, Larry. And hello to everyone. I'd like to begin with a small introduction. Next slide, please. To a friend of ours named Morris. Morris was diagnosed in 2006. Morris struggled with self-love and HIV acceptance. He lost his career, turned to drugs, and essentially or ultimately impeded his own ability to care for himself. Next slide, please. But Morris gets support. In 2015, Morris joined Thrive's peer network. In 2016, he participated in the I Thrive campaign. In 2017, he became a peer navigator. In 2018, he even founded his own nonprofit here in Atlanta called Positive to Positive. In 2019, he had the honor of introducing Beyonce and Jay-Z at the GLAAD Awards. And in 2020, he is now thriving undetectable, which is very awesome. Next slide, please. I'd also like to introduce you to Antoinette. Antoinette is a 25-year-old vibrant woman who was born with HIV. She's now an HIV advocate and social justice warrior. But she had a situation where her provider of three years didn't listen when she told him that her medication He, for whatever reason, assumed it to be something she was or was not doing. She started to hate going to her doctor and in turn lost her viral suppression. Next slide, please. But Antoinette loses the zero. In 2020, she found herself a Shiro, a new provider who actually listened. And when she asked what medications Antoinette was on, the physician immediately knew that the cocktail should have never been switched. So thankfully, they got her onto the right medications. And here in 2020, she is undetectable. Next slide, please. So I'd like to talk just a little bit about a disservice provider, which is basically what Antoinette had an experience with before she transitioned or transferred over to her next provider. 
A disservice provider would be a care provider that inadvertently does harm to a person living with HIV via their own unchecked biases or insensitivities. Some examples of disservices being provided are canceled appointments, long wait times, misgendering patients, not making a patient feel heard, wanted, or respected, bad care advice, lack of trust, not making the patient feel safe, and overall poor treatment. Next slide, please. The answer to, so thank you for that, Michael. Uh, <laughs> the answer to uh, these disservices, as Dr. Fuzzin covered earlier, is on the provider side, embodying a, 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 an energy and a culture of culture humility. Understanding that providers who talk at people living with HIV are ineffective and don't understand that HIV isn't a thing that, like the, 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 the problems and the barriers that we face as people living with HIV aren't indicative of something being wrong with us, right? It's indicative of what's happening to us, what's going on in our lives. I love that Dr. Felsen went at length to talk about intersectionality understanding the things or, or understanding that you don't know anything about what the patient goes do to traverse to your office, what, they're, what it's, they, it takes for them to even get out of bed that day. Um, again, <laughs> groundbreaking information about how to be engaged culture humility at your practice. Listen to the client. Understand that, you know, just as you're an expert in medicine, you know, that client is an expert in their body what they experience on a daily basis, their ability to adhere to this medication, what the medication feels like in their body. So seek to balance that, that the imbalance that presents, especially for the person that's coming to your office. A lot of times with people living with HIV, we just give all of our power to the provider because we feel like they're the expert, right? Seek to uh, balance that imbalance and understand that that partnership is essential. That partnership will assure that the person living with HIV is working just as hard as you are to control the HIV as well as anything else that's going on in their bodies. And then constantly check in. Understand that there's no world where we're just humble. You know, like I've read these many books and I am humble now, you know. That is not a reality. Um, our humility can be based on, you know, how we feel that day, you know, uh, whether or not somebody cut, you know, cut us off on the road. Did a person, the person that was supposed to show up at 12, show up at 12 or 1230? Those are types of things that can check, that can that challenge our abilities to be humble. Constantly checking with yourself, constantly checking with your staff to understand and to assess whether or not where people are as it relates to cultural humility, because they, the lack of cultural humility is what be, causes you to become a disservice provider. Next, we'll have Michael come back and talk a bit about our R3 project uh, program, which is retain, re-engage, retain, and reduce. It's where we love people lost to HIV care or new to HIV care back to the care that the treatment that they deserve. Michael? Thank you again, Larry. Again, as he explained, the R3 program, R3 stands for re-engage, retain, and reduce. And through this program, we link people to care, we link people to community, and we link people to love. So you may ask why R3? Well, we found that there were about 19,000 or more people in Georgia who were lost to care. And that most of these were, uh, or rather the majority of these were black gay men or black same gender loving men. While some of them may have moved, passed away or lost their insurance, most cases were due to some bad experience at a provider's office or some disservice being provided. Next slide, please. Why R3 works? Basically, MEPA, a meaningful involvement of people with HIV and AIDS. We utilize people living with HIV as peer navigators, linkage coordinators, and non-medical case managers to love people living with HIV back into care and back into treatment. And when I say we love people back into care and into treatment, we treat them with the love that they deserve, with the respect that they deserve, with the compassion that they deserve, as well as the confidentiality that they deserve. 
And not only are the Thrive employees R3 trained, but we have ambassadors that are R3 trained. We have volunteers who are R3 trained and we have community members who are R3 trained. So if at any point anyone with a need comes into a contact or it comes into contact with anyone from Thrive, nine out of 10, if not 10 out of 10, we can get them linked to the care that they need immediately. Now, we also add clients to a 24 hour peer support. Clients have access to self-love and HIV acceptance programs. And we have constant check-ins with our members. We have a seven-day check-in, a 30-day check-in, a 60-day, a 90-day, a 120-day, uh, I'm sorry, 100 180 and then a 365 day <laughs> check in. Uh, so constant check ins. We, we like to get feedback on the experiences that our members have. And we also take that feedback back to the physicians and back to the entities that we're referring to. Next slide, please. So our three results. On average, now we're linking three, I'm sorry, on average now our R3 program is linking 10 to 15 people to care per week. Now we've gone through some extreme measures to try to get, the, to get these numbers up. Uh, we run ads on Facebook, we've run ads on Instagram, we've also run ads on Grindr, Jacked, and Adam for Adam. So some of you may have seen Thrive's ads, get the care you need. If you need care, please click the link. Now, 75% of those who are retained to care, I'm sorry, there we are. 75% of those who are R3 are retained to care. So we get them through that, that second appointment, making sure that everything is on track the way that they need it to be. Next slide, please. Trying to come up, dude, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. So understanding that uh, view goes me, as providers, it's, it, it's critically important that we understand that the role that providers can play and do play in helping to eradicate the barriers that people like myself living with HIV face on a daily basis. And it's important that we're empowered and you empower yourselves to use all at your capacity to remove these barriers and to enlist the person living with HIV to be in the driver's seat of their care. This is our, our information we hide out into, we hide out in public. So feel free to reach out to us if you have any clients that can get a book of support. If you have any questions about anything that we're presenting today. We're gonna take a, a brief break and we'll see you shortly. Hi everyone you to keep us up to date on your interest uh, by completing our training survey. Let us know what training topics you'd like to hear by clicking the link in the chat box. Remember to continue to engage us in, in the chat box. I'm going to call up one of my favorite people in the world, Mr. Damon Johnson, my Morehouse brother from Jacksonville, Florida, and also a, an employee with Georgia's AETC, just an all around great brother. Damon? Thank you so much, Larry, and I do apologize. Uh, so uh, before we start this talk, I just want to ground it in the um, ground us and let us all know that this is an environment that we are, are really trying to, to, to find that centering place, that place that we can uplift everyone so that we understand that, yes, uh, uh, undetectable does uh, equal untransmittable, and that's what we do this for. All this work that we're doing is to really help providers see that, hey, the space that the only way we can get to zero is that we get our clients to uh, the undetectable space so that they're untransmittable, and that can kind of help control community viral load. However, we do have people that are living with HIV with detectable viral loads that do experience a great deal of vulnerabilities that we must address as providers, we must recognize and then address as providers so that they can get to the undetectable state so that they cannot transmit uh, HIV to their partners and or others. And also it destigmatizes and help raise that social value. So uh, this talk is gonna talk a little bit about stigma and trauma. Um, unfortunately, our partner Jim couldn't be on the call, so I'll be uh, taking uh, on the reins. So you can go to the next slide. 
So uh, the uh, definition that we're working from, um, uh, is, which is one of my favorite definitions of stigma, is that stigma is an individual. Uh, stigma is a social process, and I think speaking to this as a process shows that it's a living cycle. So that stigma uh, uh, speaks to individuals with socially undesirable attributes and or identities, and uh, of people who are seen as having lower social value than others, and as a consequence, they face prejudice and discrimination. I think that this is so important. And this is one of, like I said, my favorite definitions of stigma um, because it speaks to that process and that, that life cycle of stigma, which shows that we're active participants in stigma. So what we have to do is we have to determine how do we act as a counterforce to stigma. And we'll talk a little bit more about this um, as we go throughout this uh, slide deck. Next slide. So these are just some of the voices uh, of the community and you can read all of these quotes at your, um, at your leisure. But one of the things that I did wanna talk about is this last quote was, um, from one of our other Stronger Together uh, community forums, um, uh, individual on the call, a participant said, I am a long-term survivor. I am deeply concerned. How do we as long-term survivors make it through is double the stigma. So I think this is a great foundation for uh, some slides that will come immediately following um, this talk. So I wanted to make sure that I uplifted that. So um, again, when we talk about targets of stigma um, and COVID-19, or just talk, targets of stigma in general, we have to look at existing stigma, uh, race, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender, gender identity, socioeconomic status, and or HIV status. These are things that are already existing. And then what we find is that COVID is exacerbating some of these things. And so when we talk about this whole journey or the whole uh, journey along the continuum of care, um, we have to make sure that we uh, look at this in the context of COVID-19 because this is something that is exacerbating a lot of the things that are going on um, currently in our society. So I wanted to make sure that we upheld this and we framed this conversation, but also framed everything that we're doing from the context of COVID because it is exacerbating a lot of things such as social anxiety or social isolation and a number of other things. But what we do find is that additional stigma in the age of COVID-19 is stigma for Asian Americans, uh, stigma for urban Americans, stigma for risk-taking behaviors. So it's, there's a lot of judgment going around people with uh, uh, COVID fatigue who are now going out and people are saying, oh, they just don't care. And it, it reminds us of a lot of the stigma that was targeted at people living with HIV and is targeted at people living with HIV or at, at greatest risk for HIV, because these are some of the same topics and some of the same lines that they were saying about people, they just don't care. They're just running while they're just reckless. So these are some of the flashbacks to the early HIV experiences. So we wanted to make sure that we held that up. Um, next slide. So uh, transphobia is important when we talk about this as well, because it's a range of anti uh, uh, antagonistic attitudes and feelings against transsexuality and transgender or transsexual uh, transsexual people. So we want to uphold this and kind of define what we mean when we say transphobia, because we'll be using a lot of this language down the line and we'll talk about some of the experiences and how they can shape a person's health outcomes and how stigma can lead to uh, sickness and how a lot of these attitudes and prejudices kind of feed into that process that we talked about earlier. Next slide. So the impact of, uh, okay, so we're at homophobia, which is, uh, Another phobia uh, or attitude or prejudice against homosexual people, people with unwarranted distress over homosexuality. And a lot of this can uh, lead from the, the church. A lot of it can lead from family. A lot of it can be cultural, culturally different. So we wanna make sure that we understand that homophobia and transphobia are real and they do feed into that, like I said, that's, that process or the life cycle of stigma. And they can also, uh, they can often lead to sickness and they can often lead to people um, and service barriers for people being engaged in their care regimen. So we want to make sure that we are understanding that these prejudices and these attitudes and how they operate and how they manifest or how they directly impact people living with HIV. But also there's this thing called internalized homophobia and transphobia. And it's this depression because of those external factors that we talked about because of that prejudice that that fear of being judged or the fear of being loved the unwanted or that lack of social value because you hold a master status. These are things that can lead to internalized feelings of depression, shame, loneliness, stress, um, a hypervigilance where you're always feeling like, or you're always on the defense. So you have this transference that exists every time you have an interaction because of those negative experiences that you've experienced all throughout your life. So it makes it difficult to interact or difficult to engage. So as providers, we have to understand that a lot of times people are coming in with this baggage and because of transphobia and homophobia and just these master statuses that we possess that 
oftentimes we're transferring a lot of that uh, on because there's this thing called anticipated stigma. I'm anticipating being stigmatized because of who I am. So 34% of um, uh, the prevalence of stigma and, and trauma in people living with HIV is real. So 34% of people in this study, this uh, Chase study of coping with HIV in the Southeast, they reported uh, sexual abuse. 30% were male, 38% of females reported sexual abuse. Um, and this 38% reported physical abuse. 42% um, reported childhood uh, sexual abuse or, uh, or personal trauma. 53% reported three or more types of traumatic events and 91% reported at least one type of trauma. And I think this is so important because when you look at this, this shows this whopping and this overwhelming 91% of people living with HIV experienced at least one type of trauma. And what we have to understand is trauma can be very deadening to the soul. Um, when you think about trauma and those adverse experiences that are associated with trauma, we have to understand that they manifest and these things are real and they show up in our lives in various ways that can move us to social uh, disorders, it can move us to adjustments disorders, or it can just simply put us into this shell where we have this internalized feeling of stigma and fear and we live our lives on that from a day-to-day -day basis. Um, one of the things that is very important um, that we have to understand is childhood trauma and adult risk. Adverse childhood experiences are real. Um, and so the risk behavior often develops in response to those traumatic experiences. So as a result, I could not live out who I was or who I felt like I was for all of these years of my life. For the first 13, 14 years of my life, I had to suppress who I felt like I was out of fear of my mom not accepting that I'm a trans identified individual or out of the fear that my mom wouldn't accept that I was a, a gay man. So we start developing these risk behaviors that uh, these things that are, have been defined as risk behaviors, but um, it could really be seen as exploration because I could not live out who I was or experiment and try the things that I felt on the inside that I wanted to try. So I had to go out and sneak and do it. I had to create a jack that may put me at danger at the age of 14, or I had to create an, a, an account that may have put me at a heightened risk for HIV, or I could not talk to someone about utilizing condoms. And the only thing that my mom talked to me about was utilizing condoms for heterosexual sex, but no one talked to me about unprotected anal intercourse. So I don't necessarily know that a condom is necessary because condoms prevent pregnancy. So these are some of the things that we call risk. And oftentimes we label them as risk behaviors. However, these are behaviors that individuals could have developed over time as a response to the uh, childhood trauma and a, a response to adverse childhood experiences. So individuals will seek homeostasis by engaging in behaviors to numb negative feelings. So substance misuse is common in coping strategies. So when you think about these things, um, homeostasis is a place where our body wants to reach its equilibrium. And so if we have all these negative experiences because of who we are and all these negative experiences because of what we want to engage in, it's difficult to try to figure out where does pleasure fit into all of this. So you start doing things to kind of balance out those negative feelings to kind of help cope and kind of help navigate and live a, a healthy life or have health, uh, uh, positive life outcomes for yourself at that time. So you can go to the next slide. Um, and this is something that I wanted to ask everybody before we got into the next section. Um, have anyone on this call ever felt shame? And if so, can you put in a, a one word, one or two words of how you felt when you were shamed in the chat box? Just take a few seconds to do that. If you've ever felt shame, how did that make you feel? What were your response to, to shame or being shamed? Demeaned, depressed, invalid, devalued alone and judged. Larry, you can go to the next slide because a lot of these inferior, a lot of these are some of the feelings and the impact of shame, um, shame thoughts and beliefs. I'm a failure. I'm not important. I'm a phony. I'm defective. I'm a bad person. I don't deserve to be happy. And these are oftentimes feelings when I was working on the uh, other side and doing direct client services. What I did realize is that oftentimes when people uh, where people Sarah converted a lot of the feelings that they had, if you ask as an HIV tester at that time uh, over nine years ago, and when given a positive result, you ask, what about HIV? Uh, uh, what about HIV are you most afraid of? A lot of times you have people say, I'll never be loved. I'll never have a healthy relationship. How do I have sex? Uh, how am I going to tell somebody that I'm living with HIV? So what that spoke to is this 
this this loss of social value. So one of the things as providers, what we have to do is we have to determine how do we build resiliency and how do we build social value? And I think that's a, a thing that we have to all figure out how do we look, uh, how do we as providers look at doing this together? Because what you'll find is that resiliency isn't a magical trait of something that's built over time and that it's most important, like uh, it's most important with uh, the relationships that we build with people. So it's, it takes us to kind of, kind of pour into our clients and pour into the people that we serve so that they can reach the undetectable, uh, uh, that undetectable space and so that they can become violently suppressed and so that they can uh, share some of their vulnerabilities so that we can address those vulnerabilities to get them to that space that we all desire them to be. Next slide. So some of the likely manifestations of stigma, and again, we're gonna contextualize this during COVID-19, there's an increased level of anxiety. So um, I'm already HIV positive and now I have to put on this mask. I already feel like something is wrong with me or I'm afraid or I'm afraid that people are gonna say, okay, not only are you HIV positive, but now you don't went out and got called for COVID. You need to sit down. But what we have to realize is that these are some of the likely manifestations of stigma, feeling unsettled and insecure right now. But what we have to do is we have to figure out again, how do we encourage people living with HIV to understand that there's power and you taking control. There's power in you understanding that you do have a place and that you're just as valuable as everyone else. And so again, we have to, go, we have to make sure that we're um, normalizing things and we have to make sure that we're empowering the people that we serve to take control no matter what type of social disruption is going on and to uh, uh, be comfortable with us and that goes back to relationship building but to be comfortable with us to share vulnerabilities so that we can address those vulnerabilities um so we can go to the next slide Larry and some of the hallmark symptoms of PTSD and that's post-traumatic stress disorders are, is re-experiencing. Re so those intrusive thoughts, night terrors, flashbacks, and psychological reactivity, but avoidance and hyperarousal. I think um, one of the things that is most common, what you'll find is that um, what we found in a lot of what we did was that um, when we were on the direct service side, what we found is that a lot of people would avoid our space because of being associated with the HIV clinic or the black gay men's clinic, or uh, just being associated with something that uh, wasn't desirable. So I think what we have to figure out is that um, when you think about PTSD and some of the hallmark symptoms of it is that we have to remember that re-experiencing some of these things um, through heart rate, blood pressure going up um, and avoidance and just hyper arousal are some of the things that may be some of the, uh, some of the things that we may see that may manifest when we're serving people living with HIV. So we want to be on the lookout for these things so that we can then say, hey, I realized that you've been, you're not, you haven't been, you've missed a couple of your appointments. Is there a reason? So exploring those vulnerabilities, what are, are you avoiding? So kind of just kind of digging into what's going on so that we can kind of really figure out how do we move our patients from one end of the continuum to the other. Next slide. And so some of this, uh, some of the stick, uh, some of the times we think when we think about stigma and we think about that social process, we think about it as a one size fit all type of thing. But one of the things that we want to talk about today is intersectional, intersectional stigma. And it's a tendency for people living with HIV to simultaneously experience stigma and discrimination because of HIV and other aspects of their identity, such as race, economic status, or sexual orientation. And I think this is so important. And we've been talking about this. Now we put a actual title on this and what we have to understand is that stigma and hiv does not exist in a vacuum and when people uh are diagnosed with hiv that that's not all of who they are that's a piece of them so how do we as providers not necessarily utilize this master status and make it where this is all that they're about um people living with hiv are people who have their parents their brothers their mothers their cousins their sisters and we have to understand their friends and we have to understand that we have to look at some of the intersections of their lives and peel back those layers so that we can understand that vulnerabilities may exist on multiple levels. Taking their pill may not be the issue. It may be the issue getting to the clinic, transportation, or it may be the person sitting at the front desk that every time they come, they feel like they're stigmatized. So understanding that vulnerabilities can exist on multiple levels and understanding that that can lead to that uncontrolled viral load because if I'm, uh, afraid of coming into the clinic I, and I'm just going to, hey, I'm just going to pay the whole visit. I'm not going to go because I don't want to deal with the rude lady at the front desk or I don't want to uh, deal with having to travel 
three to three to four miles by foot just to get to a bus. So we have to understand the, there are multiple vulnerabilities that can exist on multi, multiple levels. Next slide. Some some of the behavioral focus that we can kind of encourage our patients to uh, really uh, engage in is uh, to regulate their sleep, to eat healthy, to maintain adequate hydration. Um, and these are some of the things that can kind of help control some of the stress, uh, breathing, meditation, and caution about alcohol and tobacco and other drugs. And I think here we want to make sure that we're not being uh, stigmatizing or further uh, traumatizing individuals, and that's why we use the word caution about it. If you're um, to look at this from a very a risk reduction and a harm reduction approach, and we really want to make sure that we're giving them coping strategies that are healthy and conducive to um, their uh, their day to day. So next slide. So a psychosocial focus, we can reduce, identify, develop, and treat. So reducing isolation, identifying triggers, and developing uh, skills to cope and then treating individuals on the symptoms um, or, or, or not the disorder. So I think one of the things that we this speaks to is just moving and shifting from a, a medical model to that psychosocial uh, uh, piece where we're looking at not only the psychological things, but the social aspects that kind of uh, work in harmony to uh, keep people from doing the things that they need to do or, or responding in a way in which that we may see as unfavorable or, or that, that does not optimize their health outcomes. So we can go to the next slide. So resiliency and stigma, and I, 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 we talked about this a little bit earlier, um, but resiliency is not this magical thing. We oftentimes talk about it like it's just easy to do, but resiliency must be built. And so one of the things that we want to make sure that is that we understand that we have a role in building resiliency. Uh, a key active core component of building resiliency are the relationships that people we serve have with others who care about them. So that speaks to relationship building. So we have to build relationships with the people where we serve so they can adapt when changes occur, so they can deal with whatever comes their way, so that they do believe that um, there are ways that they can cope and stress and that this will make them stronger and they can bounce back because I think oftentimes when we talk about resiliency, we talk about it from a, a, a space that is just magical and it just happens, but it's, we have to speak to the work that it takes and we have to understand that we play a role in that. Next slide. Again, this just talks about resiliency and stigma. Again, it's, it's all about accountability, agility, and attitude. So these three pillars of resiliency are something that we must understand that we must have. If we exemplify, if we exude these things, then what that shows are uh, the people we serve is that, hey, that this is possible. We must take accountability that we have a role in building resiliency. We must have a positive attitude so that the people that we serve do see that positivity and it does exude through us so that they can then change their attitude. So, and we must be agile. We must be able to pivot. We must be able to um, adapt to change. And so if, uh, instead of diving right into the uh, viral load, I would ask a person how they're doing. How was your journey to the clinic today? Or what's going on in your world before you start talking to them about HIV? Because again, that is not who they are. That's just a piece of them. So um, if you exhibit some of these pillars of resiliency, what you'll find is that they'll believe that they can handle unpleasant or painful feelings, or they'll believe that um, they can uh, strive under pressure and, um, and, and just be able to adapt the resilient attitude. Next slide. Uh, reassuring thoughts, reach out. And so I think it's very important to let everyone know that you got this, especially during times of uncertainty or times of social disruption. And that this may be a frightening time for all of us, but fear is no, a normal reaction. And I think even when you think about that HIV diagnosis or keeping a person engaged in care so they can reach an undetectable space, um, we have to understand that, hey, fear is a normal reaction and that flashbacks to er our early HIV experiences are happening to a lot of us. And so what we must understand is that, hey, while we have all this going on, that, hey, if we if we encompass our, and we embody those three pillars of resiliency, that accountability, that agility, and the positive attitude that we can build and we can grow from a space and we can conquer anything. And I think that's really important during a time like this. And always allow yourself to feel. Um, I think that's so important. And uh, we confuse sadness and, and confusion with uh, a lot of other things. But what I look at it is a, a, as a combination of collective grief. And I think that's a term that we learned from Jim. When you think about collective grief, there's just a, a, 
a collection of all the different negative experiences or whatever that you've gone through in your life. And it's a combination or culmination of those things. And I think it's okay to feel, and I think we have to give permission, give people permission to feel and also give ourselves permission to feel so that we can get through the things that we're going through. Next slide. And um, again, we'll turn it over to Larry and Larry will talk to you about some practical advice for people living with HIV from a context of a provider. And thank you so, so, so much for the, that, Damon. I um, love your framing of, of everything. So thank you for that. Um, here's some practical advice for li people living with the HIV um, and more specific for to people who provide services to people living with HIV. Ensure that your clients know exactly what's going on in their bodies, right? Like, you know, like Damon so eloquently pointed out, like we're people living with all a host, we're living with HIV, right? But we're also living with other things. We have like blood pressures, we have sugar, you know, uh, glucose levels and things like that. And it's not enough just to know like, oh, you're virally suppressed, you know? And I think that that like can set up like a false sense of security for like a person like myself who is also living with asthma, you know, what is my lungs doing? What is my, what's the rest of my body doing, you know? Make sure that we empower our members and clients and patients around, you know, uh, becoming just as in tune and inquisitive about the rest of their bodies as they are about their HIV. Create a safe, actually, no, create a brave space for your for your patients to talk to you. You know, if you feel like, you know, you, you, the person is just like, yes, ma'am and yes, sir, and you to death, it's probably because they don't feel comfortable talking to you. Make sure that you create a brave space so that where they can say whatever, you're not judging them, you know, like we're not asking questions like you use condoms every time, didn't you? Um, those types of questions don't create like a brave space, you know, ask like, well, what was your sexual, um, what was your sexual experience like for the last couple of months? Um, what were, what, what did you do? How was it? You know, create a space where pe we, people living with HIV feel comfortable, you know, saying how we feel, you know, because you, then you'll get the most out of us. Of course, uh, encouraging our members to track their viral loads and, and CD4 counts on their own uh, so that they can, you know, track their pro progression as well as changes. Um, and then making sure that they understand the other aspects of their care team, right? So, so like not just the nurse and the doctor and the, 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 you know, nurse's assistant and people on their direct care team, but what about the case manager? We understand that the case manager plays a huge role in the, in the lives of people living with HIV, especially those who maybe are experiencing changes in their insurance, might've lost their phone. They, the different reasons that we see our no-show rates go up, a lot of times the case manager can help to mitigate those. Make sure that your that your clientele, uh, as well as yourself, because I'm sure that some of you are living with, you know, uh, comorbid comorbidities yourself, making sure that we encourage our members and patients to keep a list of their con uh, emergency contacts, their medications, they know what their medications are, they know the numbers to their care team, your number even, or your contact information even, um, and let's just make sure that we're put, constantly pushing them into where, the seat that they belong in, the driver's seat. You know, we're the supporters, we're in the, we're the passengers in the, in the back seats. You know, um, they belong in the driver's seat, right? And encourage them never to leave the visit with questions. I know that a lot of times working in a care space, it can be, you know, hectic. You know, you're trying to get to this next person, but make sure that the person sitting in front of you, that person that we should care about, the person that's sitting in front of us, has no additional questions, you know, well, you know, is the, ask questions like there's nothing you're leaving out, right? You know, this is your time, you know, um, I won't see you again for another two to three months, you know, in six months, in some cases, please let me know everything that's going on. And even when they leave the situation, make offer an open uh, communication channel for them to get back to you. Because a lot of times we leave the office and, you know, a thing might dawn on us like, oh, I did have that pain in my back. Uh, you might want to know about that. And Let's be sure to do everything in our possible in our power to embolden people living with HIV to remind them again, you are in the driver's seat. We are passengers in the car. The car is your life, your health, and it belongs to you. Make sure that they know that they are the boss. Just imagine how empowering that could be. The person that you view as an expert, as you know, the, the person that's gonna lead me through my HIV journey, turning to me and telling me, Larry, you are the boss. You got this. What would you like to see for your life? What would you like for your health? That's empowering. Let's try to empower people living with HIV. Right here, this right here is a tool that we can use. This is a discussion guide. Provide this discussion guide 
uh, to your members and patients to get them to talking about their HIV, you know, identifying gaps and understanding and knowledge. Because again, we want to empower people living with HIV to take charge of their health, our health. And don't forget to complete the evaluation. And uh, the links are in the chat box. Again, these slides are being uh, recorded and everything like that. I personally would like to thank Dr. Gregory Felsen and Michael Morris and Damon Johnson for an amazing presentation and all the other team, Evan and Marcilla. And now we open it up to you. We want to hear from you. What questions do you have? Now I'll introduce them. I think Evan Pitts who will facilitate the question and answer session. Oh, there it'll be me, Marcella. Oh, cool. I love I love this part. You never know who you're gonna get. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you will all re will receive a link for the discussion guide. Um, that'll be emailed to you along with the slides and recording on Friday. And we only have one question. They were pretty quiet today. <laughs> Mercy, I believe there's some that you can't see. Um, okay. Um, that went to participants. Um, and I think that's uh, something that's really important. Um, it says, I have thought often, um, this is more of a comment, but I think it's something that we can speak to. I have, to, I have often thought me being gay made me the perfect person to counsel someone living with HIV. However, I'm not sure what about my past beliefs are being brought into my counseling and not benefiting the client. And I think this is important because um, that speaks to uh, transference. I think oftentimes we feel like we uh, are the answer because we may have shared our lived experiences that are that mirror what we believe our clients. But again, that just speaks to um, Ralph. I think that just speaks to us a dealing with uh, some of the things that we um, may have going on internally, but also being sure that we're not transferring and being sure that we're taking an individualized approach to whatever it is that we do when we're talking to our patients and are providing a, a, a service to our patients so that it is individualized and so that it is tailored to them and their needs. I think that's very important because not all gay men are 100% um, the same and not all people living with HIV are 100% the same. So I think Again, that's taking a step back and thinking uh, from us believing that we always know and really speaking to our clients and really developing a relationship and rapport with them so that we can build from that space of what they need and not what we believe they need. Um, Larry, is it anything you want to speak to about that? I did, um, but we covered it all. <laughs> you really did. Um, just to remember the, that cultural humility piece, right? So we can know, like, the person can be, like, from Baltimore, Maryland. They can be 6'2", with locks. Their name could be Larry, also Walker. And understanding, like, going into a situation with this other Larry Walker from Baltimore, Maryland, um, that just because I am also a Larry Walker from Baltimore, Maryland, that I don't know anything about this person. And the best way for me to get the most out of this visit and out of this interaction and even relationship is to allow for them to inform to us exactly like Damon said, you know, who they are, what they need, what they value, you know, um, how I should show up, you know, um, and in a way that's going to be congruent so that we can all get something the best out of the situation. Um, yeah, disclosures, you know, as a person living with HIV, when I was uh, also, you know, working in a direct service space, you know, disclosure helps, you know, so I would disclose, hey, I'm also a black gay man living with HIV. And sometimes that would help, but I wouldn't use that as a, pl a launching point to make a whole bunch of assumptions, you know, like we like this, right? Because, you know, we're both black gay men living with HIV. No, that's not the way it works. So that cultural humility piece is vitally important. Great question or comment. Thanks, Larry. Um, another question that we had was, uh, Larry, uh, I guess we can all take a stab at this and we can all define it and operationalize it from where we stand. Um, Murray spoke to us defining you equals you because some providers may be novice on the call. And when we talk about supporting it, that others may not under necessarily 100% understand what it is. And it's more to just saying that. So right. you would um, define you equals you for the people on the call and we can all operationalize it. Right, so you could use un undetectable, you untransmittable. It's based on from studies like the partner study that showed that like if you're a person who is living with HIV and you have an undetectable vi viral load, that you have no chance of passing the virus onto your sexual partner or 
you know, uh, play partners or however you engage. Um, for me, as a person living with HIV, like I said earlier in the conversation, U equals U is one of my main galvanizers for people who are newly diagnosed or who I may have a lack of inspiration for, you know, uh, handling their HIV or, you know, be getting in that driver's seat, you know, telling a person about U equals U, letting them know that, huh, what was that like the D-Day alarm? Uh, letting people know, like, look, you know, um, there's innovations, these medical uh, innovations and interventions that, you know, you take your pill every day, you can live a, a normal life, you, nothing about you has to change, you won't pass it on to your partner. But like, you know, those feelings of feeling like you're toxic and you're damaged and things like that fall away when you learn more of the context of you because you, but I would love to hear um, from the other panelists. I guess I'll take a stab and then we can go Michael and then Dr. Felding. Um, to me, you, you like you said, you define it, you, you speaks the progress that we've made as well. And I think that it's so important to uphold that progress and to understand that uh, undetectable does equal untransmittable and that people living with HIV with uh, undetectable viral load that's uh, less than 20 copies of the virus in their body. It, it really shows, or maybe less than 50 now, but um, I don't know the exact number, but what it shows is that they have a zero chance of transmitting the virus to their partners, even without a condom. And I think it's been, like you said, a, 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 a great thing for all of us because now we can engage with people as people and it kind of destigmatizes it, uh, living with HIV in a, a very positive way. And it kind of, like you said, it galvanizes the point for us as providers to figure out who does have that detectable viral load, that V equals V that we talked about, who has that detectable viral load what are their vulnerabilities and how do we address those vulnerabilities so that we can get them to that undetectable space so that they have that zero chance of transmitting their virus to their partners? Uh, Michael? Well, I think that you two have done a great job of summarizing it. Um, I know that for me, it is all about um, not transmitting or not allowing this to be transmitted to anyone else. And the more people that we can get to the undetectable point, uh, the better off we will be as far as our battle to end or our fight to end the epidemic. Uh, with V equals V, I definitely understand that, you know, again, all people will not be able to reach undetectable levels for various reasons, but we need to find ways that we include their their health and their well, well-being uh, in the care continuum as well. And really, from a provider standpoint, if you look at U equals U and the history of where this uh, this new concept came about, really started back in the 19, late 1990s, where there were studies that showed that individuals who were undetectable um, decreased their chance of transmission. And back then, we were looking at undetectable less than 800, then less than 400, and then it reached what we see today at less than uh, 200. Then it moved into stronger uh, uh, research, uh, people looking at this in more detail, and it came about the term of, of treatment as prevention. And now suddenly, oh, we can treat somebody and really prevent the transmission of HIV. And we're using that term outside of HIV now, uh, looking at other sexually transmitted infections. And then with stronger data, more research, we entered into the uh, U equals U era, really that has, I, I, I agree with everybody's comments, assisted with you know some of the stig stigma that we see um, with individuals living with HIV. So we've really come a long ways, but there is a history to it that this just didn't magically come out of the box, but, um, that uh, people have been looking at this for several years. And I'm really just excited that uh, everything that we've seen in the last few years with research. Absolutely. Um, we have a lot of, Cameron dropped the link to the preventionaccess.org. Some research that talks about U equal U and a lot of, uh, including a study from 25 countries that show that providers uh, discuss U equals U with patients that there's a direct correlation to increased viral suppression, improved health outcomes, and treatment satisfaction. And I think that speaks to R3, as well as some of the stuff that Dr. Felding um, spoke about earlier. Um, someone asked a question earlier about the, um, here it is. How can the medical providers help assess and tackle intersectional stigma with patients 
on an ongoing basis given all of the dem other demands and limited time slash capacity facing medical providers. Dr. Felding, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I really do. And, and I really appreciate this question. And, and I, it's one that's really at the tip of a lot of uh, prescribing providers' tongues. And, and, and I would approach it two ways. Uh, get rid of the word medical provider in, in your question and, and conceptualize what you see as a provider. And in, in my uh, opinion, a provider is anybody who has interaction with the client that walks through the door. So really lean on the individuals that in your team that you already have put together. You may have a case manager, a nurse educator, whoever that is that can be a part of this uh, education. So you're not feeling as a prescribing provider, I have to do everything. Well, no, you don't. You have a whole team that can have this discussion. The other thing that I would really uh, advise uh, prescribing providers do, um, and those of you on the call that that uh, we've had more intimate interaction know have heard me say this before, is you have that client that comes in. CD4 count's been 900 for the last two years. They've been virally suppressed for the last three years. And you think, oh, this is going to be an easy visit. I can kind of get in, get out, and get to lunch. That's your opportunity. Go in the room, sit down, show them their last lab work. Everything still looks great. What's going on? Just because they're virally suppressed does not mean they're, quote, stable. There might be some issues going on at the home. There might be housing issues. Uh, there might be things where they're suddenly going, uh, they're going to graduate school and they're going to be moving out of the area and they've never left home. That's stressful. That might be a trigger for them to stop taking medicines, engaging them into care wherever they're going. Job changes, insurance changes. That's an opportunity to sit down to try to be more preventative and have that discussion. And yeah, you may only have 10 to 15 minutes per client. That's unfortunate, but you can spend those 10 or 15 minutes looking at some other aspects of their care. And then if they do need, oh, there is some housing issues. Well, let's get you to see the case manager today. Let's kind of, let's kind of a bird dog that. So it doesn't get to the point you're homeless and then you're missing appointments and you're missing doses, but really talk about it before that happens. So I think there's a lot of things that can be done as a team approach, come together, do team building and kind of empower the people that work around you to take this on and have these uh, open discussions uh, with the population you serve. That was great, Dr. Felzine. That was great. Someone asked, uh, someone asked, could we define V equals V again? Um, Larry, do you want to take a stab at that? I was trying to come up with it, so I did everything else but come up with it. Um, <laughs> viremia equals vulnerable. Uh, I love the framing that uh, Damon provides. Um, not only vulnerable for opportunistic infections and things like that, but like when it relates to our members and patients and the people like the uh, people that we care for who are presenting as vir vir uh, virally uh, detectable, looking for the vulnerabilities in their lives, looking for the things that may be misaligned, looking for the the areas of intersectional or of of, of or self perceived stigma. Um, so I, I love the framing of that. Like, yes, is viremia equals vulnerable, but and vulnerable for you know social stigmas and physical uh, ailments and things like that, but also viremia is also like an indicator a lot of times of a vulnerability that may be outside of our realm or we view outside of our realm. Anyone else? Yeah, I'd I'd like to make one comment, Dr. Felzine. Again, um, I forget. You know, I, I try to mention everybody, and and again, my definition of provider is basically everybody. Um, but sometimes if, if you're in a big enough practice, meaning you have more than one prescribing provider, um, there's a lot of transference that's going on. And I've had folks that, that don't like my voice. They don't like the hair color of the other provider, that, you know, whatever it might be. They don't like the way they say something. And really say, we don't wanna lose you as a client. We wanna continue your care. How about if we see another provider next time and, and, and keep them in the system and keep them engaged. Also make sure there's peer navigators, uh, peers, people that, that, are, that are living in their shoes the best, best of their ability. I love Larry's comments, you know, Larry from Baltimore, it's meeting Larry from Baltimore. I mean, they're, they're still two different people, but still there's some common ground and somewhere to, to have that discussion. So it's really a team approach. So they may not hear it um, 
or accept it from one person, but then they hear it from another person, whoever the person that might be, it might just, it might be the navigator. It might be the case manager, whoever it is. Oh, that's why I need to continue to come. That's why I need to take the medications. That's why I need to be undetectable. They just need to hear it like all of us all through our education. You don't hear something once and you're an expert in it. It takes experience, time and hearing it multiple ways before. Oh, that's why we do it this way. Absolutely. And that's creating that brave space that Larry talked about and that LaShawn White uh, just acknowledged. And uh, Dr. Felsen, I think that's great coming from a provider that sometimes you may not be the provider for that uh, individual that you're providing a level of service to. So it may be that you recuse yourself or excuse yourself so that they can provide receive the level of service that they desire and that they need in order to be successful and reach that um, undetectable space. Because you may be one of those vulnerabilities or maybe one of those barriers to care. So I think that's very important. Um, Larry, uh, someone asked, does Thrive SS have uh, offer internship slash volunteer opportunities for students at different levels to gain more insights to aid them in their professional and personal development? He's unmuting again, guys. I am, and it changed the slide again, but I'm just gonna leave it here. Um, most certainly, I almost cut whoever was talking when that call that came through I almost like literally just cut them off and said yes we do <laughs> um so the, you can definitely reach out to us at info at thrivess.org if you're interested in any opportunities like that yes most certainly well, that was Dr. Ware we'll definitely also. make sure that we connect you to um there are the others are just comments and I, I definitely think that oh uh, okay wait I love the concept of instilling clients to love themselves. Please provide some examples of how you're doing this during the current pandemic. Also some examples of how to draw the line between and clearly communicate the love is not sexual. Oh, so that's right. boundaries, yeah. Right, yes. Um, so like uh, ways that we do that, especially in this space right now, we have our self-love and HIV acceptance work that ha happens in the form of workshops. We're filming an anti uh, a film, actually. We use storytelling as a way to show people themselves and show people their resiliency. A lot of times you can say like, oh my God, you did this thing, you did it, you did it, you did it. But when they see, when we see power and, and resiliency represented in other people that are going through something that we go through, that that's a way that we uh, find that self-love in ourselves. Um, but then also reminding, like constantly checking in and reminding us of those things that we, we we often take for granted. We often take for granted the fact that like a lot of us have been living with HIV for over for decades and before we got, received any form of support for, for HIV and we're still here. Um, uh, as it relates to the boundary situation, I mean, being a black gay man living with HIV, um, who does work in the community of black gay men living with HIV, you know, it can kind of, it can kind of be kind of, you know, hard to like, you know, draw that line and not just sexual boundaries, but like, you know, just boundaries in general. Um, uh, and we practice that as well, like especially with our staff and ambassadors, you know, how to turn off, you know, how to not answer a linkage call at two o'clock in the morning when you yourself is in the middle of a crisis um, uh, and being clear and speaking out your boundaries with uh, the networks and the people in the community. Uh, a lot of times I joke and say, like, you know, my job is really I'm a black gay man concierge, like I'm here for all the black gay men. Right. But like, I have to know, like, when, you know, to prioritize my own self, my own healing to uh, how to keep people in a, in a realm of like, you know, not breaching my own personal space. I would love to hear how other people do that. But that's those are the things that I do. And, and I and I think Dr. Felzini, again, before. And the next comment is, is look at Thomas's question in the q and I think this goes together with Larry with your answer. Do you find that many young people have to move away from their home or where they grew up to escape stigma? So that, I think mm -hmm. that's part of your self care mm -hmm. um, uh, process in this. And, and I've had some folks, especially in the rural areas I serve, I was taking care of uh, a transgender woman who really was being physically abused, not by a partner. There was some partner abuse going on, but by the community, there was abuse every time she went out into the community. And finally, we were able to help her move to a, a larger area. And she's just happy as can be because there's greater um, support um, mm -hmm. and there's there's greater resources. So sometimes I think the answer is yes. Uh, that's a challenging question. So I'll open it up for other folks' thoughts. 
Yeah, I wasn't a young person when I was in, oh, I moved back to Baltimore in 2005 and I wasn't necessarily, what I would call myself a young person. You know, I was like maybe like 20 something. So um, when I was diagnosed with HIV, but being back in Baltimore, you know, even though I had lived in Atlanta for years, being back in Baltimore really presented a whole bunch of stigma and fear for me because I was back home. I was seeing people that I went to middle, middle and elementary school with, and um, it was a barrier. It was a barrier for me. So um, sometimes, yes, you know, sometimes home is the safest place for a person. You know, you've always been who you've always been and everybody accepts you or, or acknowledges it or loves you for who you are. And some for some people like myself, I, it was a barrier, you know, seeing people that I went to school with at the, the ASO that I was being seen at, um, you know, wanting to for, wanting to don disguise and stuff like that to receive care and even like struggling to even get in care for six months because I didn't want to see, I, I had anticipated all of the stigma. So sometimes leaving home is the best thing that you can do, even if you're not living with HIV, you know, sometimes when you're at home as a young person and you're growing and maturing and becoming who you're becoming, a lot of people still see you as Lil Larry or a Lil whoever, you know, insert a certain name here. And that could be kind of confining too. So like a lot of times just moving around helps us to become more emboldened in who we are just as well. Um, I agree. And I think uh, just to echo a lot of your sentiments, I think uh, something that I always say, you don't start living until you start your life. And I think that uh, oftentimes when we're growing up, like you said, and we're back home, where our lives are already predetermined by the powers that be, are those uh, institutions of socialization, like our family or the environment that we grew up in, the neighborhood that we grew up in, until you define, okay, what it is that you want from your life and you start on that journey, that's when you start living. So I think it's important, like you said, uh, young people may have to move away, but not only young people, sometimes older people too. Uh, you may have to move away because there are so many people that live uh, closeted lifestyles and not just from a, by a gay uh, a, a way or a HIV closeted way or just a closeted life in general because they are afraid of being who they truly want to be. So you may have to move away to find and start um, your own life. And I think that that's necessary. And I think, like you said, Larry, that is a space um, of confinement at times. So it's when you break down those barriers, you can truly live and experience life. Yeah, definitely. I agree with everything that was just said. Am I, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, I was just thinking that this is um, that I'm a I'm an example of that situation. I left my hometown because of stigma. Um, it was because of the stigma around being gay, but I totally had to get out of there. It just there was no escaping it, and it was really from my family, um, my extended family that I was getting it, like my uncles and my cousins and stuff. Um, and then as my immediate family, my brothers and sisters started to grow older, I started to notice their behavior changing as well and their response to my sexuality. So I did, I basically moved across the country. Um, I moved to where I figured that there was love um, and acceptance. So I definitely, um, I can, I, I would think that there are definitely many young people who have to move away from their home uh, in order to, in order to really grow and become who they are. Are there any more questions, comments? I think that's everything, Larry. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us for this uh, Stronger Together conversation. Thank you to the Seed Tech team. Thank you to Michael and everyone, Dr. Felsen, and everyone on the call. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. All right. Take care, y'all.